Uh, tonight we're going to talk to you um, in our quarterly report, but we're going to give you insight into the first third of 2018 for Hampton Fire Rescue. The winter season proved to be one that any New, England, in, any New Englander could be proud of and gave us the expected cold with numerous winter storms, several inches of snow, freezing temperatures and driving winds. In total, we fielded 1,192 calls for service. There were 595 fire calls and 597 patient contacts. Like I said, we responded to 595 fire calls. This includes five structure fires here in Hampton and several structure fires as mutual aid. On New Year's Day, Engine 1 responded to a fire on Norman Road in Seabrook. Crews worked in a harsh winter conditions at a fire that unfortunately resulted in a fatality. The first in the state of New Hampshire for 2018, and one of a total of 1,118 civilian home fatals, uh, fatal fires in the United States since the beginning of the year. Later that same week, Hampton responded to mutual aid um, in Hampton Falls, Exeter, Kensington for fires in their communities. Uh, on January 17th, during a snowstorm, crews responded to a structure fire and a duplex on Johnson Ave. Two families were left homeless and were assisted by the Red Cross to assist them with housing. On February 18th, in the early morning hours and also during a snowstorm, crews responded to a fire at the Emerald Isle Motel on Winnicunnet Road. The resident was at work at the time and uh, he was able to come home after the fire and we were greeted by him. The following Saturday, Hampton responded to a mutual aid fire in Greenland for a multiple alarm fire at an auto repair shop. In March, during blizzard conditions, crews responded to a well-involved house fire at 23 Driftwood Road. The homeowners were away at the time of the fire. As a result of the storm, power was out in the area and Hampton Fire Alarm was not able to use the primary radio since the multiple power failures and lines down uh, caused the primary radio system to fail. We used backup system in order to um, direct crews as well as dispatch calls for most of the remainder of the day and the system was restored by evening with the assistance of various agencies. Hampton Fire responded to Crossway Terrace, located at 454 Winnicunnet Road, for a structure fire, which was quickly extinguished. The resident suffered severe burns during the fire and was treated and transported to the hospital by our emergency personnel and uh, Northampton Fire and Rescue personnel and ambulance. And on April 5, 2018, crews responded to a structure fire at 26 C Street, the Seawalk Apartments and we were met by a rescue situation and heavy fire conditions on arrival. The resident was rescued over a ground ladder after she had jumped off the third floor deck onto an adjacent flat roof. This was a wind-driven fire. It was a very intense uh, fire and had the potential to become a major conflagration due to the wind direction and the proximity of nearby structures. Our crews did a tremendous job and were aggressive in stopping the fire from progressing. The on-duty shift was fully staffed with nine personnel. Two off-duty lieutenants responded from home with the initial alarm, and <coughs> that brought the initial responding crews up to 11 people. We, respond, uh, we received mutual aid from 17 communities that night, and we're exceptionally grateful for their response. Emergency Medical Services side of the house saw 597 patient contacts during the first third of 2018. Of these, 418 patients were transported to one of our receiving hospitals. And closing in on a full year of service, we find that Seabrook Freestanding ER is now the destination 20.5% of the time. Hampton EMS personnel responded to 14 calls for overdose and administered Narcan 16 times. They worked diligently on 10 cardiac arrests and treated 13 patients for acute coronary syndrome. These numbers are consistent with a comparison for the same time period for the last three years. We remain committed to providing high quality um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation training to the community. And since January, 150 people have received CPR training. And we're scheduled to teach CPR both to UNITIL and Planet Fitness staff in the next few weeks. And I was just told today that we're also going to be teaching CPR to the FOSS manufacturing staff. We've already provided CPR and first aid training to a local home school group and the New Hampshire chapter of Sea Cadets. And we continue to expand our community outreach programs. 63 people have been trained in the national campaign to stop the bleed. This program aims to promote bystander first aid to traumatic injuries. The Stop the Bleed program has been very well received by all that have attended. We've, uh, we have trained personnel from Winnicott High School, Hampton Academy, Marston and Center Schools. We've also provided training to 10 community members on March 31st, which was National Stop the Bleed Day. They participated in the training at headquarters and expressed that this was excellent training indeed. The new ambulance was delivered to, uh, from the manufacturer to Minuteman. It will be lettered and striped in the next two weeks, and we have scheduled the installation of the power load system and have notified the state that we will need to have the vehicle inspected on completion. 
We anticipate that the new ambulance will be in service before the summer season. Firefighter Kate Meehan and Firefighter Dean Sonis are scheduled to complete their paramedic training and graduate on May 22nd in 2018. They will be taking the National Regist Registry exam in the next few weeks following and will become full-fledged paramedics over the summer. We're very proud of their efforts. In fire prevention, the Fire Prevention Bureau performed 65 inspections, issued 44 permits, and collected $1,583.50 in the first third of 2018. The table provided, which the viewers at home, I'll read for them, um, it indicates the last three years, same time period. So 2018, we saw 65 inspections, issued 44 permits, and collected $1,583.50. For 2017, it was 69 um, inspections, 52 permits, $3,370.35. And in 2016, 46 inspections, 55 permits issued, $6,878.55. There is a drop in fees collected, but we can absolutely attest to the fact that um, it's due to the construction and the way things are being built. People aren't coming in for permits right now. They're continuing in, um, with construction. As you can see from Cornerstone, Spring Hill Estates, uh, all of the areas that are working right now, they've obtained their permits last year. So moving forward, the construction is still going on. The inspections are still going on, but that accounts for the, the change in fees collected. It's a very busy time of year for fire prevention as the seasonal businesses are opening up for the summer and inspections for permits of assembly and hoods and life safety are filling up the Fire Prevention Bureau's time. Our fire prevention officer, Bill Payne, has returned from the National Fire Academy where he spent two weeks uh, completing their fire investigation program. This training is essential for him to fulfill one of the primary aspects of his job at Hampton Fire and he came back raving about the training stating that it was excellent instruction with high quality instructors. We're also working to finalize the permits and prepare for the upcoming display fireworks shoots throughout the summer. A lot of work goes into the shows before the sky lights up. Currently we're waiting on the permits to be returned from the company and uh, we have been working with the Hampton Beach Area Commission to make that happen. Communications side of the house. Hampton Fire Alarm answered a total of 7,330 phone calls from New Year's Day to the end of April. Many of these calls were uh, for service needs during inclement weather where power outages and flooding affected residents or for fires that have already been reported. Fire alarm was inundated with calls during the storms we experienced this winter season. During four of these storms, they also had to deal with significant fires. The most significant was the C Street fire, which went to a third alarm within 11 minutes from the first phone call. During this fire, where crews were giving radio reports, updates, responding to rescues, and more, Fire Alarm coordinated the response of 17 mutual aid companies, two of which were unable to assist, therefore they had to be bypassed in favor of another community. No radio transmission went unanswered, and all of the resources requested arrived ready to work. This was a tremendous effort. Great job. For administration, Hampton Fire Rescue has been active with the parent, teacher, and administration meetings both at, at both the SAUs regarding the concerns for student safety, especially in light of the recent events in Parkland, Florida. We're continuing to work in concert with Hampton Police Department in developing our plans for response potential and for threats at our schools. In fact, we have four members attending training this week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, for an on-site um, training in Chumsford. We experienced several winter storms this season. We added storm coverage in order to handle the anticipated extra volume of calls and bolster the on-duty force to ensure proper management of all calls, which did cause overtime. And I am concerned that we are coming into our high summer season, and I want to ensure you that we're keeping a watchful eye on our bottom line, but I do have stress over that. We're waiting with bated breath for a word on our assistant to firefighters grant for replacement of mobile radios. We'll be sure to update the board when that information becomes available. Engine 2, the 2000 Pierce pumper that was purchased from Warminster, Pennsylvania, has been placed in service and is now part of the fleet. Marine One has had a new starboard side motor installed and has been serviced in preparation for the upcoming summer season. May is pump testing month and all will be tested and serviced as part of their annual preventative maintenance cycle. Ladder One, our 2006 Pierce, will be leaving us for three weeks at the beginning of June. As a preventative maintenance, the truck will be repainted uh, to repair the significant and noticeable corrosion and cracking that's going on in the paint. And this is in order to extend its life of the vehicle. The funds for this were encumbered from the 2017 budget, as were Marine One's motor. Engine 4, our 2016 Pierce Pumper, um, which resides at the beach, responded to several calls during the blizzard and associated flooding in the area on January 4th, 2018. As a result, several of the electrical components were exposed to salt water. Salt water and electrical components are not a good mix, 
and despite pressure washing the vehicle, the components began to corrode. The vehicle was evaluated by Minuteman and found to have extensive damage to the electrical system. Their recommendation was to have the truck returned to Pierce for a thorough overhaul to be sure to, of a proper fix. Primex was notified and evaluated the vehicle and concurred. Engine 4 was transported to Appleton, Wisconsin by flatbed trailer for repairs and we do not have an estimated time yet for the repairs. As you are aware, the C Street fire left the soup kitchen without a home. With your indulgence, and thank you very much for it, they have been using the East Apparatus Base at the beach station while the, uh, they work to find a new permanent home. This is, we're certainly glad to see that this has worked out for all involved. Hampton is an ever-growing community. New buildings, even new neighborhoods, are being introduced to all corners of town. We are exploring staffing and response models, and we look to report back to you soon. And I thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions, if you have. Questions on his report? Mary Lloyd. Well, it's really too bad that you haven't been very busy. <laughs> right. <laughs> I will say, and, and I appreciated your report, that I would be willing to put you up uh, as a candidate for the understatement of the year because you said, we experienced several winter storms this season. Yes, we have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did. Yeah, that made me think. Now, I have several things <coughs> for you and the department with the summer season coming up. Okay. First of all, you are understaffed. Is there any hope of getting any kind of grants so that you can get a few more personnel in that department? Uh, I'm, I'm a, a civilian, but it looks to me like you certainly need eight more bodies in that department. Any hope for going after grants? And I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I, I really do. The one thing about grants is that they're not guaranteed. You have to vie for them. And right. you're going up against other communities that have potentially greater needs. So you have to state the case. Uh, right now, what we, and, and as I discussed with the C Street fire, that night in particular, it was approximately 10 o'clock at night that the call came in for fire. Uh, there was no ambulance call going on, so I didn't have personnel that were at Seabrook ER or Portsmouth or Exeter. They were all in-house at the time, and they responded. That was a total of nine. Currently, we do something called running down, and we've talked about this offline before, but running down, if there's uh, a captain that's out, he gets replaced one for one. Mm -hmm. If there's a lieutenant, they, they get replaced one for one. On the firefighter side, um, when the seven firefighters were fully staffed, if one takes vacation, if one's sick or if there's somebody who's injured, then that person is left unfilled. So we'll run down to eight. Um, in running down, we're doing that as a financial responsibility to maintain that side of the house. Uh, it's not the best idea for staffing. I would like to discuss mm -hmm. in the future uh, moving to maintain nine at all times, minimum. The idea of adding staff, especially through a grant, the, the grant for that is the SAFER grant, which is um, a federally funded FEMA grant. That changes yearly, the, the way the, the funding works. Um, it's a partial funding, it's not a full funding. Uh, this year, as far as I know, it was 65% and 35% for the first two years, and then the town bore the higher responsibility in the third year, um, and you, I believe it was 75-25, where you would take 75% of the cost as the town. Um, don't quote me on that, I could be wrong on that one. So the SAFER grant requires certain things, and you have to meet certain standards. Um, it was by our FEMA rep. He told us that in order to do that, you have to be going towards uh, national goals. And for us, the national goal for career fire would be uh, NFPA standard 1710. That's a very difficult standard to meet for a small community. But you can do so looking at mutual aid and their response and getting your numbers up. But they have to be going towards the national standard. Currently, the NFPA prescribes that on a first alarm fire response, with fire showing, if somebody's going to a fire, there should be 17 people responding. Currently, if we have nine, that means that we have to have two outside mutual aid agencies as well as all the chief staff's um, officers coming in. If we were looking at that from a perspective of getting staffing through a SAFER grant, the, the, the way it was explained to me, okay, and I haven't done the, the far out research on it, but the way it was explained to me is that you would need to be going towards this and one mutual aid response would be okay. So an engine coming in from another community with three people on it could be added to your mix. If we had nine and brought it up to 10 with the staff officers and additional engine coming from outside, we would get to 17. Right now, it would take two fire engines with three and three 
from two different communities to bring us up to that level. So I don't know that we would be awarded the grant based on that. Good so grief. we can't we can't guarantee a grant anyway. That's we certainly tried last year for an AFG grant for radios and we we didn't get a grant. We're trying again this year for the same thing. So it's not something that I would rely upon. But like I said to you at the end there, we're looking at staffing models. We're growing as a community and um, it's certainly something that we're looking to explore. Hope springeth eternal, I guess right. we could say. Um, we're going into the summer season. Right. This should scare everybody because all of the incidents that are related in here are off season. That's true. Well, it's not summer yet, in spite of the fact that you just had a few little storms in there. Now, um, ambulances at the beach, and I've had people call me on this. Um, one ambulance at the beach this year, of course, that means staffing, and you're also trying to staff a boat. Uh, probably, ideally, we should have two ambulances at the beach in the summer season with all the people that come in. Uh, have you a feel for where you're going with the ambulance service at the beach once we hit the summer season? Currently, our, our goal is to maintain. As you know, that we have, um, we have an arrangement where the, the ambulance is stationed at headquarters right now, 141 Econet Road, mm -hmm. and the beach fire station, if, there, if we are down to one paramedic per day, uh, if another paramedic is sick or injured or something like that, the one paramedic that's that's on duty per day will be stationed on engine four or engine two now, engine three now, down at the beach fire station uh, for a quick response. They're bringing all of the same equipment. The transport vehicle comes as the ambulance, but the medical treatment is getting there directly with the engine response, which is <coughs> at the beach fire station. As far as staffing a second ambulance, that would require to me, in order to do it appropriately, it would require 10 people per day. And let me tell you why. Because we need to have an engine uptown yeah. to respond to fire calls. Yeah. We need an ambulance, which requires two people to yeah. do that. If that's the case uptown, it's the case at the beach as well, and we have a fire engine at the beach for our highest hazard district, that needs to maintain three people, a lieutenant and yeah. two firefighters. Yeah. The ambulance would need to function the same way, which means two people. So to get there, that would be such a quantum leap to say that we're going, right now, I, I'm trying to propose that we stay, that we get to nine and maintain that level. The quantum leap to get to 10 would certainly be something that must be explored, but we're, you know, we're dealing with um, taxpayer dollars and we don't want to do so unwisely. We want to spend their, their money very, you know, <laughs> seriously and make sure that they get the best bang for the buck. Now, in addition to one ambulance mm -hmm. at the beach, you have paramedics in-house in case people come up to the fire station and need a little help. Maybe they cut themselves or on sure. the beach or whatever. So you're still expected to respond to walk-ins, if you will. Sure. Right? Walk-in medical aids, yep. Uh, hmm. With the size of the town, at the rate we are growing, and with uh, the burden placed on this town with, with the beach uh, in the summer, um, I, I don't know how you're doing it, frankly. I, I applaud what you're trying to do, but it's I don't know me. how it's you're doing crews. it. It's not me, it's the crews. They're doing a tremendous job. Number, and next one is, I would like to see, Mr. Chairman, if no one objects, to ask the chief to produce enough reports to give to the budget committee, just more copies of the report that he just gave us for the budget committee at the next meeting, just stick it in the budget committee slot or whatever, but I think it would be a very good idea. This is very a very comprehensive report, and I would like to see that uh, provided to the budget committee. I don't committee. have a problem with that. Thank you. May we do that? And uh, I asked you earlier today yes, about action wipes, and I wasn't familiar with those, but would you mind describing to the public? Because I think that's a, a great extra tool that you are using, and I just found out about it by accident just watching the news on NECN a couple of nights ago. Sure. And especially with the concern over cancer, would you mind explaining that to the board? Sure. So in a method to decontaminate, uh, leaving a fire building and then getting before getting into the uh, rig to come home, um, we're doing gross decon. And at any fire scene, you might see that the firefighters are being hosed down and yeah. to get off the, the larger material. Mm -hmm. But on skin, especially the neck uh, under the hood, hands, face, yes. uh, areas where soot is going to accumulate any type of carbon. Um, we're using essentially baby wipes. 
-hmm. They're like baby wipes. And they don't have uh, fragrance or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They're not going to hurt our gear. They're designed to work in concert with that. But they're taking off the, the largest portion um, on the hands, on the face, so that they can remove that carcinogen, uh, at least in part, you know, f um, by sitting on their skin. They, they remove it before they get in the truck and come home. We've made some major changes, especially in light of the fact that we've, uh, we've experienced cancer and its loss mm -hmm. in our fire department. And um, Tuesday, Tuesday, May 15th, will be our two-year anniversary for Firefighter Kyle James. Yeah. So it's something that's uh, near and dear to our hearts, and um, it's a very emotional subject for us. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the captains and the lieutenants know that if there's a fire in town or out of town, they're, they're allowed to take the utility truck so that the crews can take off their gear and bring it back, not in the cab with them while they're riding home, mm -hmm. put the gear into the uh, washer and the extractor, and then dry it. And then um, all, all the guys will be taking a shower and, and all the firefighters will be taking showers, cleaning up. Uh, we actually have agreements with our mutual aid companies who are coming in and we're doing the same for them. Um, if they come back from a fire and they're going to take a shower, we're going to stay an extra few minutes, probably be about 10 minutes longer. And then taking showers, everybody's going to get cleaned up. That's our goal. So it's a cycle, but we're starting to really bring that home. I appreciate that you're doing that. And I was given to understand from watching the presentation on NECN that even leaving the poisonous substances on your skin for Exposure. a while, your skin can absorb these things and cause greater risk. For years, um, they always thought, and, and it's not hard to imagine that breathing the smoke and the soot and the byproducts combustion was a big problem, and it is. Yes. Um, but we developed the SCBA, the self-contained breathing apparatus, see the masks, mm -hmm. see the bottles. Um, that does a tremendous job. But then the exposure, they were saying, well, it's transdermal, so you got to watch out where your skin is. So then we became fully encapsulated, hands, feet, everything. Uh, now they're finding that, and they've done studies in heated environments, um, your skin transdermally is able to absorb more carcinogens, but it's coming through the gear. It's actually surrounding you while you're encapsulated, and so people are being exposed that way. That's why they're coming home without gear on. They're not contaminating that, that environment, and then they're taking a shower immediately. But with it. this report and with the activity you've had so far this year, uh, that's a that's a wake up call. I have a couple of questions under the turnout, but that's okay. I'm we'll finished. Go, let's finish this part first, and then we'll go. Well, to the he's turnout. on turnout. I'm I'm finished with this part. All I, right, let's uh, let everybody else talk about it first, and then we'll get to turnout. Yes, that's okay. what I said. Regina, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I had my ears being bent too about the ambulance down the beach. I know we talked about that before. Yes, yep. So what you're saying is engine four, which is not with us right now. It's currently right. engine three, right? right is yep. engine three pretty much has everything that an ambulance has except for a way to get the person correct to the hospital. All of so, the medication, all of the the um, cardiac monitor, the um, trauma equipment, it's all there, and they're able to provide initial care just as if they were taking the equipment off the ambulance. Okay. The ambulance arrives, and then they'll be able to transport. Um, oftentimes, our ambulance might be at another facility. It might be at the Exeter Hospital. It could be at Seabrook ER. And sometimes we need mutual aid. The, the fire where we talked about that, all of our crews responded as firefighters to 454 Winnicott Road. So we needed another outside mutual aid ambulance to come in to transport the patient. But he was already being rendered care by our providers that were on scene. <clears throat> so they were able to use the equipment that's on engine one and engine that day, engine three, to provide the care. And then he was transported by Northampton. Okay. And I do, I agree with Mary Louise that it's, I mean, it's, this is the first four months of the year and yeah. the fires and the storms, the word tremendous is a huge understatement. I mean, you guys are great. I, I wasn't here for the April one, but I mean, I saw pictures and it was just, it was like a movie. It was. I mean, the C Street fire, it was yeah. just amazing. Yeah. The, and how you guys uh, they did a great job. handled that fire. So thank you very much. And didn't last year, was it that we had asked the state about whether or not they'd split the cost with us as far they as... they said no, yeah. Yeah, and they said no, right. But yeah. that wasn't... How much was that? Was that like about $80,000? It, it was about, well, last, last year's dollars, it was about 35000 for us and 45000 for the state. So in order to, to yeah, meet in the middle... 45, 49, somewhere around there. I and thought. that wasn't 24-hour that wasn't coverage. We were doing a day coverage there so it wasn't a full 24 hours from i think we started july i think i started july 6th because of the dates of the the request through labor day 
But we were talking about splitting the cost roughly thirty-five, forty thousand dollars, and gotcha. that was refused. But luckily, oh. the mutual aid that you have with the town Tremendous. is exceptional. Absolutely, so, and they're bringing the same level of care. We have right. paramedics in Seabrook. We have paramedics in Northampton. So you know, we're we're not failing on that end. Right. I want you to know that. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Jim. Yeah, I just want to. We're, we're talking about staffing. We're talking about a variety of things. Currently, do you feel you're providing a safe? environment for the people ambulance wise fire wise i do i would like to see our staffing stay at nine obviously and that's why i'd like to talk to you about that again in the future okay but um yeah we're doing a, the the crews are just doing a tremendous job absolutely okay so in this year's budget when you develop it and stuff you'll be talking I about will. yes sir that with, with us and with the budget of committee course. and because it is taxpayer dollars that and we have about. to be wise to that absolutely and people have to approve it Right. We're going, to, we're going to have it. You know, you said you're going to Seabrook to the emergency room 20% of the time now. That's true. Is that a large increase? Well, it was, if or you remember, we, we, brought, we actually yeah. brought them in to talk to you. They started June 1st. Okay. So it was zero yeah. last year. Um, now it's 20% of our call volume. The crews go there. They have one physician on duty there. But their, um, their method of care and what they're able to handle the turnaround time for our crews is significantly faster. Mm. Uh, for smaller, especially smaller items, they're able to go there. Um, if it's a if it's a person who's having a cardiac event and they need to have intervention immediately, they know to go to the right facility for it. If it's a major trauma, they'll go to anywhere that they need to bring the patient. But um, the people are also responding and they want to go to Seabrook here, so it's working out pretty well. It's a cost savings going there? Uh, well, it's a shorter duration turnaround for us, so, certainly. So we're in turn a vehicle, fuel, absolutely. And what would the percent increase of calls this year be over last year, coming up to the summer? Coming up to the summer, we're approximately even with last year and the year before for EMS. Okay. Um, we are down this year. Um, it's, it's strange because if you look at the call volume versus call severity on both sides of the house, fire and EMS, I would say that this year our call volume is slightly down, but the intensity of the calls <coughs> is raised. We had more significant fire in 2018 than we did in 2017 for the same time frame. So we had more fires, um, more fire calls last year, less fire calls this year than last by, I think it was 20, and I didn't provide that number, I apologize. It was a small number, but the severity of the calls, the significance of the calls was certainly elevated this year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you for the report. Rick. Yeah, um, you know, all through the years, it's been very important, uh, the, uh, the shared response that we've done. And Hampton's always done their share for the other communities, just like the other communities do their share for Hampton. So it's always been an important part. This is nothing new. Right. Uh, it's always been an important part of our plan. Um, I just wanted to say, I understand that, that uh, uh, the place in Seabrook actually isn't that busy. Um, they've had, through the winter particularly, it was not, yeah. it, business is not as good as they would like it to be. Uh, they're hoping that it will be busier during the um, summertime, um, from what I understand. Uh, but it is good that we have the opportunity to go there, and I keep hear from just people I know that more and more people stop over there. I guess they're opening another one in Dover, from what I understand. Um, and you know they seem to be growing quite a bit at Portsmouth Hospital to begin with uh, I don't know if the same is true as for Exeter Hospital but Portsmouth Hospital seems to be growing quite a bit they are and um, they undertook a, a great um, challenge to become level 2 trauma certified and currently Exeter is undergoing a challenge to go to level 3 trauma certification wow. so everybody's growing in the area for sure mm -hmm. so is uh, uh, which is uh, a stronger trauma play, th three or two? Two. Two. So more capabilities. Um, level one trauma centers, uh, Mass General, that sort of place like that, um, they're usually associated with a teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the other side of the house. You know, they, they bring in students and residents. Uh, level two, there's less research going on, but the their capabilities are the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Well, it's good. I'm glad to, your report's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I got a couple of things. Yes, sir. Um, vehicles for the storm. I know you got a couple parked outside there right now that you borrowed from somebody else. And uh, are we going to start to look at some for us? Um, we are. I do believe that Chief Sawyer's been on that. Uh, the police side of the 
the Homeland Security grants, um, they seem to have a much more efficient path to acquiring vehicles. Um, as far as I know, the green vehicle that you see over at headquarters station has been acquired, and I don't know that it, it's not, but um, that was at least at the time we thought that it was. The beige vehicle, the five-ton truck, belongs to Newton Highway, and uh, we've retained it. We're actually looking to bring that back as soon as possible. So, okay. But we're um, going to look at down the road. We are. Eventually Chief getting some that. of our own, for so right. we're not putting fire trucks in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly right. Absolutely. They're not submarines. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I was at the fire at April, in April down so the beach yeah, there. Sir. <laughs> yeah. uh, you guys did one heck of a job. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, the manpower, and I know you spoke about the dispatcher too, but I mean, that that fire with what you had there in the in the, in the volume of fire you had in that shorter part of, amount of time, I was surprised we didn't lose more of that block. I was very surprised. Uh, but you did a great job at, at getting in the mutual aid, and fortunately you were at nine men when you did it and the ambulance wasn't out of town so again thank you to your men mm. and women of the fire department yeah, absolutely all the uh, firefighters they did a, a great job uh, career day the other day over to uh, Hampton Academy well, it's Hampton Middle School it's not the Academy anymore uh, it is uh, the Academy well they uh, Hampton Academy Middle School not junior high so uh, so Captain Cutting and Kate Meehan Yes, both of them were over there and uh, representing you well. And it, it was good to see that. It's good to see you guys getting out and doing a lot of that stuff. I know you've done a lot with the, with the, the CPR mannequins and stuff like that. And it's, it's good to see your employees out there doing that. Uh, kudos also. Um, I spoke with the, one of the ladies that works at the soup kitchen. She could not believe the response she got from the firefighters down there in the, yeah. in the fire offices that were helping them move stuff around, doing whatever they need, and you having it in there. It was, it, we know it was a short time and it was an inconvenience to your, your guys, but I know the community really appreciated you guys having that there. Um, and I wanna, I wanna speak on the manpower. You know, I talked about that back at our last, at the end of our last budget session. And I really think we do need to concentrate, especially this summer on the nine. And we might wanna see how, what it would cost us to do that over the summer months, if you could bring that back to us. I think. I think you'd have the support of this board yeah. um, because it, it has showed how important it is. And then we should look at going to the 10 eventually. Yes. But we really should concentrate first more on getting the nine men. So um, other than that, great report. Oh, go ahead. Just one more quick follow-up in this because I did forget to mention the boat. He's not only responsible for the ambulance responses at the beach, but he's got to staff that boat. Yep. Especially, just so you know, that that's not separately staffed. That's no, cross, cross trained. So they come from. I realize. Okay. I realize that. Yeah. But that's still men. Uh, yeah, and the if boat? there's a boat call, everybody goes. Yes. Everybody goes. Yes. So, the, but that's the, the fire service, and that's the way it's been. You take one call at a time, and you, and you deal with what you got and what you have with who you have. Right. Uh, so, all right. The next uh, thing is turnout gear. I turn out yet. Could, could we possibly do the donation first because that should be real quick. Okay, we can do the donation. Uh, sure. I'll also move that we accept the donation of the CPR mannequin to Hampton Fire Rescue from the Girl Scouts, which is you very nice. Talk, speak about it at all? So our EMS officer, Nate Denio, had received a request from the Girl Scouts. Uh, they wished to donate a CPR mannequin to Hampton Fire Rescue uh, to assist in the delivery of CPR education. The Girl Scouts have been through the program and received CPR training and first aid from Hampton for some time now. As a part of the community service, um, they are required to donate part of the cookie sale profits. They feel that this would accomplish two goals because they'd be giving back to the community and they'd also be tr bringing this training to more people. Uh, we asked for this uh, acceptance through the, through the board for a total cost of $138.97. This is a CPR mannequin that gives instant feedback, so it lets you know how you're doing, uh, which is a new AHA standard. We have uh, several of those now, and this would be an additional one which would help us at least do three or four more people per class. I already have a motion from Mary Louise. I'll yep. second. Seconded by Regina. All those in favor? Unanimous. So, okay, now we will talk about the fire turnout gear. Okay. Uh, Mary Louise, you brought yes, that up. You wanted to. I did, because I am concerned about this. I'm going to ask Fred to help first here, because we had a discussion um, on how we could explain the, the fund. Uh, set up that you explained to me, Fred, if you'd be so kind, so that we can keep on top of this. We cannot have 
um, a lack of uh, proper turnout gear with proper dates. It can't be more than 10 years old in modern days. Would you explain to the board what you told me about the... Um, I'll give it my best shot. Please. Thank you. Uh, if we have uh, two sets of gear, complete gear, certified gear for each firefighter, that's 80 pieces of equipment, basically. Yes. And that's a cost of $240,000, which is something we don't want to front up all at once somewhere. My suggestion to the board is that we, we put together an account uh, separate from the budget and we put $138,000 or one half, about one half of that in the budget, in the, in the account. And then we put in um, one, one tenth of the cost of the $240,000 or $2,400 a year, uh, $24,000 a year, <clears throat> uh, in that account. And then we just draw down as we need the equipment by date and replace it as it comes along. That'll always give us a cushion in there. We won't have to worry about putting money in. It'll be there. If there's a year we have to skip, we can afford to do that. Um, and that will solve the problem. But we have to keep on top of the problem in order to do that. And that's the only way, real way to do it. It's like the ambulances. You know you're going to buy it. You know yeah. you, you, know you have to have it. It's replaced every, uh, yeah. so often. So we should be able to. Every 10 years, if we put the $138,000 in and we put in $24,000 a year every year, yeah. we should be able to do that for 20 or 30 years before we really have to start increasing the cost. Yeah. We'd have a little interest on that account, right? We would. We earn yeah. interest on it? We would. Um, the other thing, well, what concerns me looking at the list, first of all, you have some individuals in your department retire. So they have to be replaced by another firefighter, but the incoming firefighter may not be the same size Correct. as the outgoing firefighter. So you're going to need new gear. Um, if I look at this, you've got two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven firefighters here whose gear uh, needs to be replaced uh, because their gear is dated in 2009. So next year is 2019. Next year is our 10-year. And you're at your 10-year limit. And it looks like this hasn't been focused on in recent years. We should never be getting to a point where everybody's gear is, is um, coming up for replacement together. In addition, the secondary gear. How many, I see gaps in this list, Chief. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> some, and some of the pants and coats are different years. Um, I don't, how do we get this figured out? How do well, we get well, back on it? If you remember in 2015, um, as a new fire chief, yes. I had brought forward the idea that we were going to be in trouble in 2019 with gears because big gear issues because uh, in 2009 there was an AFG that. grant that came through and there were 33 sets purchased yeah. so I made a proposal to the board and the board supported it at the time what I was looking to do is begin a program replacement for primary sets of gear so that when 2019 hit we wouldn't all be looking to re yes. review it all um, so to that end that first year we requested six sets and then four subsequent sets per year, every year. Mm -hmm. Currently, um, our vendor was in last week measuring the last two. Um, so the measurements are off to the vendor right now, and we're going to get four sets this year. We got four sets last year. We got four sets the year before. We got six sets before that. There are five sets remaining to be purchased, plus a set of pants and a set of coats, um, vice versa, one, for one firefighter, one for another. Lieutenant Gannon um, had gotten... Um, his gear was damaged at the DBW fire when we had a DBW shed fire. So he needed new pants. We bought him new pants then. His jacket now needs to be replaced. So what we've done is we've done um, upgrades as needed. We've done repairs as needed. The new firefighters that we've hired, and we've hired a lot of new firefighters in the last three, four years, um, they've all gotten new gear. So what we're doing right now is their primary sets are within the time frame that we need. The idea of having a secondary set is imperative but it's not free. 
Ooh. So in order to do that, there has to be management. But I sat before the board in 2015 and told you that we needed the primary set to be within date. And so that was my goal spelled out. And I didn't want to hammer too hard on the budget. I didn't want to do that all at once. So we did it in a program phased in type of uh, purchase. So right now, what you're seeing, there are five, if I'm not mistaken, next year we'll, we're due to replace five sets and we'll be complete. Well, it's showing 10 here. <clears throat> he said he already has four that are coming now. Right. So well, they'll come from that list. Left. There's there's it's five with a with a pair of uh, with a jacket. I think we should let him take care of this. I understand that, but we are. Tr so, and Mr. Mr. Welch and I have had long conversations about this, and he's uh, he certainly um, got a, a beat on this, and he understands what he wants to I've do with the article. I've heard Mr. Welch talk about it too, and I think right. we should let the people that are in charge do it. It's not up I, to us. I well, it is up to us because we're well, going to be funding I think this. We need to listen but there to are the ten, people that are the head of these here. departments. Whose primary date is 2009. He's I can the read. Chief. Mr. Welch knows what he's doing. Yeah, but I can read. Okay. Yeah. I think that you ought to go read and a book. I just want to make sure. All right. Let's yeah. let's let's bring These, it back. Let's bring it back under. First of all, I have I have another question okay. related to this. I remember when the new beach station mm -hmm. was built. Right. And if I recall correctly, you had two brand new washing machines. One. We bought one brand new one, and we had the one that was at Winnicott Road re, uh, okay. replaced, moved over. Do you moved. have washing machines uptown? I literally yes. don't remember. I have one extractor at each fire station, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and one dryer. But you have nine people out there, or however many yep. respond to a fire, so... In the course of 24 hours, it, in the course of 30 hours, we can wash all sets of gear that were at that fire. Okay. But so, that's where the secondary... Correct. So gear as, comes in as that gear is being laundered because if you have another they fire, another, right? They have to respond. They're using right, exactly right. So the secondary gear looks a little um, <clears throat> tricky here, too. Sixteen years old. But the uh, gear was bought in two thousand two. I've got two of those, three of those. Therefore, again, not not free. Right. So I've actually discussed with Mr. Welch and last week we were uh, required, the department's heads were required to submit our capital improvement plan. Yeah. And for 2019, I actually put in for um, a, a second set of gear for $130,000, um, 40 sets of gear um, as part of the capital improvement. Now, Mr. Welch's idea would certainly do one better and give us an, you know, a longer duration than one time purchase. Um, so that's certainly up to Mr. Welch and the board to decide. But we did look at that as a capital improvement because it is a capital improvement. There's a lot of money there to be spent. So but this is 2018 right here. Are and we doing budgeting tonight or what? I'm getting. I think that this is ridiculous. That this is we we have this talked about it. I, I believe the fire chief has explained what his proposal is. I also believe the town manager has explained what he would like to see done. And as we move forward with the budgeting process, we will bring that back. It's not up to us uh, to run the department. So could we well, go around and, and have yeah, other people yep, talk? Yep. So I think we have every right to ask particularly well, and we asked, so particularly I'd like to hear from somebody else on the board. This is public safety. I'd like to hear from right. somebody else on the Regina. board. Regina. What if he has five more fires? Well Yeah, well there's a lot of what ifs right now, but I like to say that one since you have come on board, you've been fairly aggressive in yes, tackling this, and obviously you're going to make sure all the primaries are there before we start working on the secondaries. Ideally, yeah, looking over here, yeah, there's a lot of things that are old, but it looks like between you and the town manager, you got it worked out, and, you know, you've gone through the primaries, so the next logical step would be to work on the secondaries. So I see that is in process of what's going to happen. Yes, is that correct? Yep. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Jim. Yeah, I'd just like to say that you've had a plan in effect, right? Yes, sir. You've been dealing with it. Yes, sir. You've come for money in the budget. Yes, sir. Do we have a lot of complaints from the firefighters about it? No. No. So we're working cooperatively to make sure that we have a safe environment. Yes, sir. And I think this board supports that totally. I can and I, I, I don't know. I was getting the impression that you weren't. I was getting the impression that somebody was saying it wasn't being dealt with, and I don't think that that's the case. I think it's being dealt with up front. And I think we'll continue to deal with it up front. 
Rick? And I've heard Mr. Welch discuss it, and I've, uh, you know, I've listened to you in the past. I think everyone's doing a good job. I don't think it's our job here at the Board of Selectmen to run your department or Mr. Welch's department. So I'm happy with the way it's going. I think you do a good job, and if there's anything you need, you need to bring it up. We, I've heard the, uh, that there are, you know, uh, one member of the board feels that something's not right here, but I think you're doing a great job, and I think Mr. Welch is doing a good job, and I'm, I think it's sufficient. We're not talking about budgets here tonight. So I, think, I think the, uh, the gear is in much better shape than when I used to be on the fire department. <laughs> I mean, we had it's canvas bad. patches on, on coats. Right. Uh, you've done a much better job. You've brought it. You've got a long way to go. Right. But you've traveled a long distance, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, I can see a point where you're gonna, you want to get by next year. You want to have all the primary sets of gear at least by that 2019 because you did buy a lot of them at that point in time. Uh, and I like Mr. Welch's idea on, on, on starting up a capital improvement fund mm -hmm. for the gear. I think that's a, a, a correct way to go because it's, it's not something that you buy once and then don't have to buy again. That's true. It's something that has to be replaced constantly. When you know, and you, you've got people with two different t dates of gear on. Well, that's because if something gets damaged, you've got to replace it to do it. That happens. That's part of it. But I think you, you're doing a great job. Keep doing the good work on on making sure that the guys are protected. Make sure they're safe. We'll continue to work on on the gear. Um, and I don't think. Rusty, yes. what's the standard? Ten years. Ten years. That's what, and that's what he's working on. Ten years max. Yep. On, years. On the, so on. we still have another year and a half. Right. So I anticipate that the primary sets will be taken care of, as I told the board in 2015, by the, ma the marching out of time and the purchases. I believe that we will accomplish what we need to for primary sets by then. Now, the other side of the coin is that buying everything at once means that in 10 years' time, yes. you need to buy it all, you get all again all at once. That's here. why you have... It seems like the grants in the past did some good in this play, this area. Absolutely. This is maybe a better area to, dis to discuss grants. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. That's, that's all we have from you. Okay, wonderful. Have a great night. Thank you all so right, much. All right, thank you.